Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I want to speak to you about the power of low tech. So one of the most vivid memories from my childhood in Australia was sitting glued to the television, watching images of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Does anyone remember this? Put your hands up. Wow. An oil tanker that was sailing through the Prince William Sound hit a reef and started spilling 11 million liters of oil into the ocean. It was the biggest oil spill that the US had seen. So, after days of watching this unfold, I made a decision. I walked into the kitchen and I announced to my mum that I was gonna become a marine biologist. And after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, I would spend hours anxiously wondering things like, what are we here for? And who is protecting the earth? And who is protecting all these animals? Today, my concerns haven't changed that much as I've watched my own country burn to the ground. Those wildfires, or as we call them, bushfires, that have been burning across Australia for the past four months are an indicator of climate change. But like the Exxon Valdez, they're also a man-made disaster because we have the ancient technology that we know can prevent them. They have wiped out 25 million acres of bushland. They've killed 33 people. And it's estimated there's over a billion animals that have died in these fires. They have completely destroyed entire ecosystems. This is a satellite image showing smoke from the fires on the East Coast, affecting the air quality as far away as New Zealand. And that is the distance from California to New York. And while the news cycle has slowed down, these fires haven't. But in the midst of this catastrophe, we've actually learned something that's really interesting. The ancestral lands that still practice cultural burning or fire stick farming, They've been fine as these fires have raged around them. Indigenous pyrotechnology evolved over millennia has cut down the destructive impact of these fires by half. And in some ways, these Aboriginal methods, they resemble the Western ones, but the ancient approaches are more comprehensive. They use precisely timed, low intensity fires. They respond to soil types, geology, trees, the breeding cycles of animals and the flowering cycles of plants. The knowledge and practice of fire stick farming we call TEK. That means traditional ecological knowledge. It's passed down for generations through mythology. And in this storytelling is this incredibly sophisticated understanding of land, of technology, of practice. And all of these things together, they create this incredibly sophisticated understanding of humankind's role in the world. And what's even more interesting is that pyrotechnology didn't just evolve in Australia, it evolved all over the globe simultaneously. And we can find people who use pyrotechnology in Australia, where we have the Aborigines, the Mayans, the Chaga of East Africa, the Kayapo of the Amazon, and the Anishinaabe of Northern Canada, who believe that a mythological creature called the Thunderbird, through the blinking of its eye, shoots lightning down to the ground to begin the spring fire burn. The Kayapo of Brazil, were taught to use fire by a jaguar man they met upon descending from heaven. And this led them to create this unique circular village using the fire to fertilize the soils of the rainforest, which they then transform into agricultural villages that they call apete. And while they live in this so-called arc of deforestation, they protect one of the largest tracts of tropical rainforest on Earth that is the size of Kentucky. The Kayapo women, several whom have recently emerged as chiefs, can be distinguished by this V shape that they have shaved into their hair. And after burning the forest, they add 250 food plants and 650 medicinal plants to form an apete which they then connect with trails that are interspersed by these satellite gardens. 
that they use to transport plants between their villages. Meanwhile, they also plant hidden plots, which they use in times of food scarcity. The Kayapo children grow up with a really different understanding of their place in the world because the Kayapo identify as one with nature and they believe it is their spiritual responsibility to protect and to defend it. They describe how their ancestors learned social skills from insects like bees. So during ceremonies when mythology is being passed down, mothers will paint their children's bodies with animals or insect markings in their honor. We commonly think of this as nature-based technology and bringing plants and trees into buildings is an amazing high-tech innovation. What low-tech shows us is how humans have been dealing with the extreme conditions that we are now facing. For millennia, by designing technologies that are symbiotic with nature and that harness the intelligence of complex ecosystems. We can design like the Kayapo, who use fire to not destroy the forest, but to improve the soil and clear debris. Then they introduce 900 plant species around which they build their homes that altogether increase the carbon offsetting and the habitat potential of that original forest. And this is because in nature, there is something called a cascading effect. And that happens when we work with our environments. In other parts of the world where cities contaminate their rivers and water supplies with sewerage, Calcutta uses a sewerage-fed aquaculture system. This is the East Calcutta wetlands, which roughly cleans about half of the raw sewerage that comes out of the city of 15 million people per day. It saves the city about $22 million in operating costs. It's a technology that is a fishery, a wastewater treatment plant, it's a farmland, it's a pasture, it's a rice paddy, it's a community hub, and it's also a heritage site. The fish farms produce about 16% of the fish that is supplied to the city, and it employs 60,000 farmers. And this is all done through a symbiotic process of fish, algae, and bacteria. The East Calcutta wetlands is the largest wastewater-fed aquaculture system in the world. So, why can't we, as designers, imagine bringing this kind of technology to Nairobi or Nigeria or even to New York or New Jersey? On the island of Java in Indonesia, flooding in Jakarta just displaced half a million people, while on the other side of the island, where the coastal lowlands continuously flood, there is this uniquely Javanese polder dike aquaculture technology. It's called the Sawa Tambak. It's the highest yielding rice fish infrastructure in, in the country of um, Indonesia. And it's specifically designed to actually work at this elevation of one to two meters above sea level. And it's organized around the life cycle of fish and rice. And as a system, it's adapted to either prevent flooding or to prevent drought while maintaining this continuous food supply and also a habitat. Meanwhile, back in Jakarta, which is flooding, the Dutch continue to sell their standardized technologies with a plan for multiple seawalls, for new shorelines, and for islands, which they are going to make Jakarta's own version of Dubai's famous Palm Islands that will be dotted with luxury hotels and accommodations. But it's gonna be in the shape of the mythical Garuda bird. So island communities all across the Pacific, they're already rejecting these one-size-fits-all technology approaches that are import imported from richer countries, and they're questioning the actual efficacy of promoting these resilient technologies. What's even more interesting is that China has its own 2,500-year-old polder dike system that protects downstream cities from flooding while producing textiles and food. This is the Mulberry Dyke and Fish Pond system. It produces fish and silk through a cycle that happens between mulberry trees, through silkworm rearing, through the silkworm feces being fed to the fish, and then the mud at the bottom of these ponds being used to fertilize the mulberry trees. Are we drowning in information while we're starving for wisdom? 
Mostly resilient technologies are single purpose infrastructures like dams, walls, levees, which we are universally applying across the globe. We don't consider the polar productive fish ponds or the Indonesia, of the Indonesians or the Chinese as resilient technologies that already embody the intelligence of the cultures and of the ecosystems which have evolved them. Why is that? Why have we followed industry into a paradigm of development so disassociated from nature? It's questioning our survival. And why are we again applying a suite of high-tech homogenous technologies and ignoring local wisdom? Because it's somehow considered primitive? Why are we designing floating cities while ignoring the technologies of aquatic civilizations who have already been combating the same crises we now face? like the 6,000-year-old Madan in the, in the wetlands of Iraq, or the Uras in Peru, or the Kyoga, or the Inta, or the Abenaki. Climate change is the biggest existential crisis of our times, and it is clear that our connection to nature is broken, and the threat that that poses has recently reframed one of my own important questions. What are we here for? Children these days now ask, how long are we here for? How long will we be on this earth? But my question remains. For indigenous people, there is an understanding that humans are the protectors of the earth. We need to acknowledge that the wildfires in Australia are as preventable as the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And the crisis of our warming world requires the entire diversity of ingenuity and innovation born from thousands of years of living in harmony with nature that indigenous people can offer. The people of the Great Lakes are guided by the original instructions. They're not exactly instructions, they're more actually like a compass. They provide an orientation rather than a map for the future. And as designers, our role is to create a new ground for nature. Low Tech is calling attention to an entire body of nature-based technology that humans have evolved over millennia to confront climate change. When we begin to explore new hybrid forms of low tech using biodiversity as a building block, that's when the next generation of innovation will be born alongside a new understanding of why we are here. Thank you.